Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kinda represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer to peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward they came out with what was known as a domain but fast forward to the year 2000 Microsoft releases their newest domain technology and they call it uh, Active Directory and Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle alright and a domain controller was a a server essentially that had a database on it and that database was the Active Directory database so let's just kinda fix that here this little cylinder looking thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent my Active Directory database so uh, AD alright um, and this was is what we still call to this day we call it ADDS Active Directory Domain Services and usually if you hear that term uh, Active Directory Domain Services it means it's an on-premise domain so anyway um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller you the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really one reason being um, to break up the disbursement of load these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers and the more machines you got uh, you know you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller right the other consideration is redundancy if you only have one and that server goes down well you're in trouble right so we want to have multiple the other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here, and this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my uh, user. 
So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now the interesting thing about user accounts, or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate. So everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other. So if I create a user account on that first one, well, replication is gonna occur between uh, both of them. And so this little arrow thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent replication. So domain controllers replicate. That means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands machine and it's gonna you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that, that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works, and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines, clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, All of these machines would register with our DNS, all right? And this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database, and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together, this, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know, every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our uh, domain controllers too is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, group policy objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. 
Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO, but what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate, so when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have, um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back, we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering you know, we've been using it for, for decades, and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated, a lot of them over the years, to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past, so it's very common. And this person needs the ability perhaps to, you know, be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay? Um, and we've got a file server, but, you know, ultimately we, we you probably are aware that, you know, in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So, you know, your companies might have, they might have a file server, but then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that, that users need to access. Let's, let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular by Microsoft on-premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices, and um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here, make a little bit of room here. 
and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary, but nowadays it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker. This, uh, this little, this little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good all right i'm just gonna i'm gonna give him like a let's give him like a devil horns some devil horns here and maybe like uh you know he's he's in a bad mood i'm gonna give him a frowny face and give him some fangs and maybe the fangs are dripping blood every okay no i'm just kidding <laughs> sorry sometimes i get carried away all right but uh anyway that's gonna be my hacker all right goofy looking little hacker person all right and um, so we don't want this hacker like spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So the way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server or also known as an RAS server because it stood for routing and remote access services. But um, anyway, remote access services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall and that would be it. Wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would, we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server, okay? So you set up a web server, all right? Maybe this is gonna be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you gonna do that? Where are you gonna put that web server? Are you gonna put it internally? inside the domain like you see here. And the reason that's scary is because you'd have to open up port 443, port 80, which is the HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about, you know, people getting, you know, allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ 
demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there. Uh, whatever ports there that you need and now traffic would be able to get to this web server okay um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources the only traffic that you might allow would be VPN okay um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work all right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I want to look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file server, SQL exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? And you could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody. It's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU and they can grow and shrink as they need. And that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity. Of course, when you get into cloud computing, you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know, the, the board in these big data centers. But 
not to get into that just yet here, but that's the idea. Hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is. And with that is really where, you know, cloud computing started to come into play, which I'm not explaining in this video, but hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well, the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization. And now we'll, in this next section, we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services. So with the creation of virtualization, it got companies thinking, companies like Amazon and Google and Intel and IBM and eventually even Microsoft that, hey, we've got these massive data centers. Uh, why not? allow people to pay us to host their virtual machines on our data center. So in other words, we can get people to pay us money to host their virtual machines and they don't have to deal with all the headaches of dealing with everything on premise. So this is really the idea of where cloud services came from. And so I'm going to draw this kind of big cloud here. This is going to represent cloud computing, if you will. We'll have a connection coming down here, okay? And I will just kind of clean that up a little bit, make it somewhat look nice. So this being, you know, the big I, big thing is this is not an, a new concept of, if you think about humans as a whole, we have offered services for years. I know how to change the oil in my car, but I don't necessarily enjoy doing it. So I can pay a, uh, a mechanic shop um, the, the fee and they will do it for me as a service, right? Well, this is the idea of cloud services. So there's some acronyms I want to introduce you to, the first one being the term IAAS, and that is infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service means the cloud provider is offering their infrastructure for a fee as a service, okay? So the idea being something like this, instead of me having to host my virtual machines and all that in my on-premise environment, I can pay this cloud company to host virtual machines for me. They can also host a virtual network for you. They can host, uh, they can have storage that's uh, offered to you. They can have firewalls, virtual firewalls that are associated on those virtual networks and virtual load balancers, okay? They can have apps out there that are available. They can have virtual databases that are hosted in the cloud. So essentially just about anything you could imagine that you can host on premise can be hosted out there in the, the cloud service. Uh, now, Amazon, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, these various companies offer this Microsoft's cloud service uh, that does this, their, their IAAS service is called Azure. Now, let me just kind of clarify, you may pronounce that name, that word a little different than I do, Azure or Azure or Azure. Actually, it, years ago when I was first learning Azure, I actually went to uh, the internet and started watching videos of the developers that created Azure and the first few developers that I watched, that's how they pronounced it. They pronounced it Azure. So that's how I just assumed that it needed to be pronounced. Of course, I learned later down the road that not all the developers even agree on how to pronounce that word. Some of them pronounced it Azure, Azure, uh, Azure. I've even heard somebody pronounce it Azure. So this is one of those tomato, tomato, pronounce that word any way you want to pronounce it. That's how I say it, which is Azure. Okay. So Azure is Microsoft's official um, inner infrastructure as a service. And the way that it all works is you pay a fee for what you use every month. Basically, how much CPU, memory, storage, network, all of that that you use, that's what you're going to pay for. Okay, now there are some other terms, uh, other uh, acronyms that I want to introduce you to. There is an acronym called PAAS, which stands for Platform as a Service, and an acronym called SAAS, which is Software as a Service. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the idea there being that there are, well, we'll start with, uh, with Software as a Service first. 
software as a service, the idea is that there is a fully functional app or application that is 100% ready for you to start using or your users to start using. All you got to do is just jump right in and start using it. Okay, so there are some uh, Azure services that are software as a service. There's also what are called platforms as a service. Now, platform as a service is kind of a, uh, there's a little bit more work involved from an admin standpoint. So a platform as a service means there is a some type of software platform that is available for you to start using and it's 100% ready for you to use, but you have to go and administer it and use it before it's going to really do anything. Uh, a good example of this is Microsoft's directory services in the cloud is called Intra-ID. Intra-ID. All right which I want to make, it's very important that you realize that this was formally called Azure AD and there's still a lot of documentation out there that refers to this as Azure AD. So it's very important that, uh, that you are aware of that. Now you are taking my course right now and you should realize that um, I have hundreds of hours of videos that still may, that I've, I've got to update that involve that term Azure AD. There are literally hundreds of hours that I have recorded using the term Azure AD and I'm in the process of updating videos but be aware that I don't have them all upgraded. So you may hear me refer in the course to stuff as Azure AD. I actually have a video on this for you to watch after these foundation videos. It's a video that says do not skip. So please do not skip that video. Make sure you watch that video because it's going to talk about this name change. So anyway, the name is now Intra ID. It's just a name change. They changed it to Azure AD. The services are pretty much all the same. It's just a name change. Okay, so Intra ID is a platform as a service. Now it is Microsoft's directory services. This is where your user accounts and passwords and groups and permissions, role permissions and all that are all managed through Intra ID, formerly Azure AD, okay? Um, whereas on premise in a domain, we called it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. All right, I think that's part of the reason Microsoft changed the name to kind of distinguish the difference between the on-premise uh, Active Directory and the former Active Directory, Azure AD, to Intra ID. Anyway, um, this platform as a service is ready for you to use, but there's only like one user, and that's the admin, and then you're responsible for going in there as an admin and adding users and controlling things. That's why it's a platform as a service. It's not... 100% ready uh, set up. You have to administer it. Now, Microsoft's main uh, platform as a service uh, functions and software as a service, they have something called Microsoft 365. So there's really two parts to the Microsoft Cloud Service. There's Azure, uh, which is mostly focused on the IaaS side things. And don't get me wrong, in Azure there are also some platform as a services and software as a services, but it's mostly geared towards IaaS. Whereas Microsoft 365 is mostly geared towards platform as a service. Now these two are very related. Microsoft 365 sits on top of Azure. You can't have Microsoft 365 without Azure. And if you create an Azure account, then it'll allow you to automatically create a Microsoft 365 account. So these are all related. You're not just going to create an Azure account or not just going to create a Microsoft 365 account. They're pretty much linked together. Okay. Now, in the Microsoft 365 services, you have lots of platform as a services and software as a, as a service. For example, uh, we have the what are called the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, which that was formerly called Office 365, and that's the downloadable version of off the, the Microsoft 365 apps, formerly the Office 365 apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of that. And there is also something called Office for the web. Now that is fully a software as a service. The, uh, the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, that is actually a mix. It's a platform as a service and a software as a service. Most people refer to it as a software as a service because they're downloadable apps. But as an admin, from an admin standpoint, we have to administer that. So the administration side of it is platform as a service. Uh, Office for the web is 100% software as a service. These are web-based versions of the Office apps that are ready for you, for your users to use. They get Once they get a license, they can use it. Okay, then we have 
exchange online. Okay, so the administration side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service, right? And then we've got SharePoint online, which is the same idea. It's a, you know, admin side is a platform as a service, but the user side, which is what most everybody focuses on, is a uh, software as a service. We have Microsoft Teams, same thing for that, okay? Um, you know, for, for messaging and, and all of that fun stuff, we have... Uh, a product called Intune, which is an incredibly powerful product, uh, mobile device management, mobile uh, application management. Intune is what is sort of taking the place of GPOs in the cloud. So on premise, we could control the settings and parameters and attributes, and we could deploy software and all that using GPOs on premise. Well, now when it comes to the cloud service, we can use Intune. We can actually control on premise machines from Intune. So it is very, very powerful, an incredibly powerful product. Then we've got we've got OneDrive for Business. OneDrive for Business is a cloud-based storage that users can have access to. So anyway, there there's actually so many products that are cloud-based products. There's no way I could put them all in here, but here's some of the main, you know, main things. Now, as far as the licensing and, and all of that, with Azure you are paying for what you use, CPU, RAM, storage, and network. But for the Microsoft 365 services, you have what are called subscriptions, and you purchase a subscription with a certain amount of licenses. So if, for example, if I purchase a Microsoft 365 subscription, I can purchase a certain amount of licenses, and I can issue those out to my users, and I will pay a monthly fee for however many licenses that I've got with my subscription. Okay, and that's just a, a giving you a basic understanding of how that works exactly. Okay, so ultimately, though, if I could kind of color code this, uh, we'll say that, you know, the, the Azure side of this, IaaS, and again, Azure does have some platform as a service stuff as well as software as a service, but it's mostly geared to be a I, uh, infrastructure as a service. And then the uh, Microsoft 365 is mostly platform as a service, software as a service. So if I was to kind of draw a... Um, you know, kind of just draw around these, we would say that the these right here are all geared towards Microsoft 365. And then this, these are geared towards the infrastructure service, which is Azure. And both of these, Azure and Microsoft 365, they share intra-ID. They share intra-ID, okay? Yellow, or uh, red and blue make purple, right? <laughs> okay. So they actually, um, you create users in the Azure side or the Microsoft 365 side, you're going to see the same users because they are linked together. They share the same directory service. So it's important to understand that. Now, the other piece of this is what about situations where you want to link all this together? So it's not uncommon nowadays for companies, you know, to have this triangle, to have this uh, on-premise domain, and then also start utilizing Microsoft's cloud services. Um, and then, you know, in the for years and years, they've always pushed this thing called SSO. SSO is single sign-on, where you have a, a user has a user account, and that user account gives them access to everything they need. Well, we don't get SSO if you have to have a user account to access things in your domain and then a different user to access things in the cloud, right? Well, Microsoft has ways around that. They actually have uh, services that you can use for linking these together. And that service, let me just kind of move some of this around a little bit so I can make a little bit more room. We'll put the DNS server there. We'll move this little RAS server down over here. And the server is called Intra Microsoft Intra Connect. And it was formally formally Azure AD Connect. Okay. So then so again it's called Intra Connect now and it used to be called Azure AD Connect. And um, I'm definitely I, I like to refer to it with the old name as well, just because be advised you really kind of need to know the old name as well, because there's still a lot of documentation that will refer to this as the older name. The newer name is IntraConnect. The the older name is is uh, Azure AD Connect. But this was a server you could set up on premise, and what it would do is it'll synchronize your user accounts 
out to the cloud. So your on-premise user accounts would get synchronized. So whatever users you have on-premise, and you don't have to synchronize them all, you could pick and choose which one you synchronize, but your user accounts are gonna sync out to intra-ID. And now what'll happen is, you have this thing called seamless SSO, where when your users log on to the domain, it logs them on in both places. They log on to the on-premise domain as well as in the cloud, which is really, really cool. Now that is a heavier weight version. There is actually a, um, a lighter weight version that's a very, very lightweight application. You don't actually have to dedicate a server to it like they kind of want you to with Inter uh, Connect. There is actually another lighter weight tool called uh, IntraSync or IntraID Sync, which is a lighter weight. Now there's some pluses and minuses to go in either route, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but the uh, the traditional way to do this was to use uh, this here, IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect. Now the other thing I'll tell you is this does not sync back. So it would sync users out, but it won't sync users that are created out in the cloud back to on-premise. You cannot currently do that. You can't synchronize users that are created in intra ID down here but any users can be synced out and it'll even make it where if they change their password like out in the cloud it'll it'll sync that as well so anyway that kind of gives you a, a rundown of that now I'll also tell you that Microsoft is moving away from domains in fact if you um, if, if you've got an on-premise domain like like what you see here, then yeah, it's a great idea to, to utilize this. But if you're a new company, and this really pains me to say it because I have um, fed my family for over two decades by, by not only teaching about Active Directory on-premise, but also implementing Active Directory on-premise as a consultant. Um, and so it kind of pains me to say this, but as a consultant now, I'm not even recommending that newer companies implement a domain anymore. Um, a lot of companies are now moving to the cloud and there's ups and downs of that. But to be honest with you, in most cases, your co a company gets out cheaper by utilizing uh, cloud services, okay? Um, and so nowadays you can actually set up on-premise machines and manage them through Intune and things like that that are in the cloud. You can even have client machines hosted in the cloud, but I'm not gonna dive into that right now. Uh, ultimately though, if you are a company that's been around for a while, then the traditional approach that you see here where you've got a, a domain um, and then you're starting to move into the cloud, you can set up IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect, uh, or Intra ID Sync, and, which is the lighter weight version, and you can have things synchronized out to the cloud. All right. All right, well, hopefully these foundation videos have been instruct, instructional to you. I hope you got a lot out of this and you're ready to move on. Microsoft has a really powerful feature that uh, you can utilize in your uh, Azure Microsoft 365 environment to help protect your Office 365 um, uh, documents as well as email, uh, as well as Teams, all that. It's called Microsoft Defender for Office 365. Now, I'd also like to point out that there's an older name for this. Uh, this was called ATP. So this is formerly known as ATP, Advanced Threat Protection. So just kind of a warning if you're reading some older documentation and there's still even some areas of the, the portals themselves that can sometimes re, uh, refer to this older, this older name, uh, Advanced Threat Protection. Okay, so uh, just kind of a forewarning on that. But um, yeah, so Microsoft Defender for Office 365 is now um, is the new name for it, and the old name for it was ATP Advanced Threat Protection. So what is Microsoft Defender for Office 365? So this is a feature that is, the, the main goal is to try to protect against different threats, um, various threats, some of the most common types of threats that somehow can make their way into your organization. Um, Originally, this was just geared towards email, um, and so that I guess you would say that at its core, that was the, the original plan for it uh, back originally when it was initially ATP when it first came out. And um, the main thing they're trying to, to look out for here is the types of attacks that hackers will pull via email, uh, which involves things like sending attachments that have malware, you know, some kind of a, a, a attachment file virus um, worm, whatever, inside your email. 
Another thing, of course, would be when uh, you receive links, like phishing links, you know, in which a, a hacker might send an email and try to trick you into clicking a link, right? Um, you know, maybe a, an email that appears as though it's coming from your bank uh, or maybe one of the social media sites like Facebook or Twitter or maybe something like Amazon, Netflix, I mean, you name it. Um, there's been phishing emails created for everything under the sun, it seems like, these days. And so the Microsoft Defender for Office, the main game plan here is to try to uh, watch for that and test for that and determine if there is actually some kind of malicious uh, information in this. Okay, now the uh, the other thing of note here is this this is more than just email now. Uh, you know, originally when it first came out, when originally when it was initially ATP, um, the goal was just, just to kind of uh, protect email and it worked in conjunction with Exchange Online and your Outlook clients and stuff like that. But now it's actually gone to a whole new level because it can work with other with other products, and I'll and I'll take a look at that here in just a minute. So it's more than just email, I guess, is where I'm going with that. All right. Uh, now, some of the things you're going to do to try to um, protect yourself uh, with the help of Microsoft Defender for Office 365 is you're going to utilize policies, reports, and there's also investigation tools for trying to assist in working and dealing with those particular threats. So. We're going to be taking a look now at, at some of that. So, uh, Microsoft Defender for Office uh, 365 policies. So there are policies that are going to uh, implement rules and restrictions that are going to determine what it is that you want to allow. Now, the first thing that we've got is uh, something called safe attachments. And of course, by its name, you can tell that safe attachments was originally one of the, the initial features that they had for email, right? Um, but again, it does go beyond that. Safe attachments is something that is actually going to um, analyze attachments that come uh, come through email or even attachments that are deployed through, through you know, files that are deployed within SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams as well, all right? Now, this is a really cool feature. What this does, Microsoft actually has this thing called the detonation chamber that's running on, on their end, uh, in which whenever a, uh, a file gets loaded within um, your, uh, somebody is, is using it via email, it comes in through Exchange Online, through email, uh, if, it's, if it's attached to SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, shared you know, for collaboration, the file will be tested in the detonation chamber. The detonation chamber is actually a container, like virtual machine type of environment. Uh, and it gets opened up inside that detonation chamber. And it gets tested to see what that file is trying to do. If it's attempting to um, you know, access the, the registry in Windows, if it's uh, attempting to uh, change a system file, you know, it kind of analyzes what that file is doing, and then it gives it a rating based on uh, the activities of it. And at a certain point, if there's enough of the if the rating is is a high rating in regards to it being malicious, then at that point, safe attachments can um, kick back and let the person know that this file is malicious. Uh, and so that great thing about that designation chamber is is it is it runs and tests the the the, the file, it makes sure that it's not able to, you know, get access to the outside world. All right. So that's what safe attachments is, um, this policy that you can implement. And then you've got safe links. Now, it's along the same lines. Safe links uh, is where maybe a link is being shared. And again, this is, you know, a link being posted somewhere, whether it be email or Teams or whatever it is. Um, the email is being shared. Same kind of thing. Uh, your Microsoft 365 and Azure services is going to test that link. If the link leads to code and it is going to be, um, code needs to be executed, or if it leads to a file and it needs to be executed, then it's going to happen in the detonation chamber that I just mentioned. Okay. So again, it's going to, it's going to test that all out. It's going to verify that it is, it is not malicious. Give it a rating. If it, if everything is okay, it's going to send it on its merry way. But if it's not okay, then of course, at that point, uh, it's going to kick back and can, can um, remove that link. It can even replace the link with another link. And this is also all stuff you can track. So you can track um, 
whenever links are saved, you can even track how many users are clicking links if you want uh, and, and get a feel for, you know, the types of users that are generally falling for, uh, you know, those types of attacks. And that's actually where the anti-phishing protection is right there, is that, you know, we, uh, we can analyze uh, emails and things like that as they come in and, and the links and the attachments and we can verify that there's not like a phishing attack going on where, you know, a, a hacker has, is making it look like, a, you know, an email or something's coming from your bank or whatever it is to try to lure you into clicking it so that they might be able to steal your credentials or trick you into installing something malicious. Ultimately though, the goal here is to prevent this type of attack and uh, allow us to put policies in place that can uh, not only try to stop it, but also detect it, alert us, and um, try to educate us on what we can do to prevent more of this in the future. Now, as we start digging into Microsoft 365 security, the first thing to be aware of is that we have Microsoft 365 Defender, we have Purview, and the two are directly related to each other. Now, what I'm trying to say is you can't really learn Microsoft 365 Defender without learning a little bit about Microsoft 365 Purview, and you can't learn Purview without learning Microsoft 365 Defender. So let's talk a little bit about all of that. Let's take a look at the admin centers before we uh, really start diving in more. So here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to click the show all ellipse symbol right here, and then you're going to see a blade called security and a blade called compliance. The security blade is going to bring you into the Microsoft 365 Defender admin center, and then compliance is going to bring you into purview. So we'll start here. I'll just click on security which brings you to security.microsoft.com, and here we are in Microsoft 365 Defender. Uh, now, always be aware that when you activate your licensing, um, you need to give it a while before some of this stuff begins getting populated. So just be aware of the fact that, uh, depending upon when you activated your licensing and all that, you may not have everything that I have right here. You sometimes need to wait 45 minutes to an hour before everything is fully there. So I wouldn't stress out about that too much, but as you can see, here we are in Microsoft 365 Defender. All right, and you have various uh, blades here that you can control. I'm not gonna be diving into all the blades in this video. I just wanted to show you the admin center. Okay, now if we come back over to portal.microsoft.com, we'll click on compliance this time, and that's gonna bring us into the Microsoft purview. So here we are in the compliance area. So these two are very, very related. Microsoft Purview is very much geared towards the compliance side of Microsoft 365, okay? This gets a lot into making sure things are properly compliant. Uh, it's going to allow us to generate various types of policies that will involve compliance and, uh, and all that. And then when we get back over here to Microsoft 365 Defender, this is going to involve us being able to implement certain policies uh, such as the Microsoft uh, 365 Defender for Office 365, all of that. Uh, cloud App Discovery, which gets into Defender for Cloud Apps. So there's a lot of things here for locking things down. But remember, these two are related. Purview and Defender are related. You can't really learn one without learning a little bit about the other. Okay. All right. And of course, we are going to you know, now that we kind of have an overview of the two admin centers, we can kind of di start diving in deeper. Microsoft has a really powerful feature that uh, you can utilize in your uh, Azure Microsoft 365 environment to help protect your Office 365 um, uh, documents, as well as email, uh, as well as Teams, all that. It's called Microsoft Defender for Office 365. Now, I'd also like to point out that there's an older name for this. Uh, this was called ATP. So this is formerly known as ATP, Advanced Threat Protection. So just kind of a warning if you're reading some older documentation and there's still even some areas of the, the portals themselves that can sometimes re, uh, refer to this older, this older name, uh, Advanced Threat Protection. Okay, so uh, just kind of a forewarning on that, but um, yeah, so Microsoft Defender for Office 365 is now um, is the new name for it, and the old name for it was ATP, Advanced Threat Protection.
So what is Microsoft Defender for Office 365? So this is a feature that is, the, the main goal is to try to protect against different threats, um, various threats, some of the most common types of threats that somehow can make their way into your organization. Um, originally, this was just geared towards email. Um, and so that I guess you would say that at its core, that was the, the original plan for it. Uh, back originally when it was initially ATP when it first came out. And um, the main thing they're trying to, to look out for here is the types of attacks that hackers will pull via email, uh, which involves things like sending attachments that have malware, you know, some kind of a, a, a attachment file, virus, um, worm, whatever, inside your email. Another thing, of course, would be when uh, you receive links, like phishing links, you know, in which a, a hacker might send an email and try to trick you into clicking a link, right? Um, you know, maybe a, an email that appears as though it's coming from your bank uh, or maybe one of the social media sites like Facebook or Twitter or maybe something like Amazon, Netflix, I mean, you name it. Um, there's been phishing emails created for everything under the sun, it seems like, these days. And so the Microsoft Defender for Office, the main game plan here is to try to uh, watch for that and test for that and determine if there is actually some kind of malicious uh, information in this. Okay, now the, uh, the other thing of note here is this, this is more than just email now. Uh, you know, originally when it first came out, when originally when it was initially ATP, um, the goal was just, just to kind of uh, protect email and it worked in conjunction with Exchange Online and your Outlook clients and stuff like that. But now it's actually gone to a whole new level because it can work with other, with other products. And I'll, and I'll take a look at that here in just a minute. So it's more than just email, I guess, is where I'm going with that. All right. Uh, now, some of the things you're going to do to try to um, protect yourself uh, with the help of Microsoft Defender for Office 365 is you're going to utilize policies, reports, and there's also investigation tools for trying to assist in working and dealing with those particular threats. So we're going to be taking a look now at, at some of that. So uh, Microsoft Defender for Office uh, 365 policies. So there are policies that are going to uh, implement rules and restrictions that are going to determine what it is that you want to allow. Now, the first thing that we've got is uh, something called safe attachments. And of course, by its name, you can tell that safe attachments was originally one of the, the initial features that they had for email, right? Um, but again, it does go beyond that. Safe attachments is something that is actually going to um, analyze attachments that come uh, come through email or even attachments that are deployed through through you know files that are deployed within SharePoint OneDrive and Teams as well. All right. Now this is a really cool feature. What this does, Microsoft actually has this thing called the detonation chamber that's running on on their end, uh, in which whenever a a file gets loaded within um, your, uh, somebody is, is using it via email, it comes in through Exchange Online, through email, uh, if, it's, if it's attached to SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, shared you know, for collaboration, the file will be tested in the detonation chamber. The detonation chamber is actually a container, like virtual machine type of environment, uh, and it gets opened up inside that detonation chamber, and it gets tested to see what that file is trying to do. If it's attempting to um, you know, access the, the registry in Windows, if it's uh, attempting to uh, change a system file, you know, it kind of analyzes what that file's doing, and then it gives it a rating based on uh, the activities of it. And at a certain point, if there's enough of the, if the rating is, is a high rating in regards to it being malicious, then at that point, safe attachments can um, kick back and let the person know that this file is malicious. Uh, and so that great thing about that designation chamber is, is it, is it runs and tests the, 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 the file, it makes sure that it's not able to, you know, get access to the outside world. All right. So that's what safe attachments is, um, this policy that you can implement. And then you've got safe links. Now it's along the same lines. Safe links, uh, is where maybe a link is being shared. And again, this is 
you know, a link being posted somewhere, whether it be email or Teams or whatever it is, um, the email is being shared. Same kind of thing. Uh, your Microsoft 365 and Azure services is going to test that link. If the link leads to code and it is going to be um, code needs to be executed, or if it leads to a file and it needs to be executed, then it's going to happen in the detonation chamber that I just mentioned. Okay. So again, it's gonna it's gonna test that all out. It's gonna verify that it is it is not malicious. Give it a rating. If it if everything is okay, it's gonna send it on its merry way. But if it's not okay, then of course at that point, uh, it's gonna kick back and can can um, remove that link. It can even replace the link with another link. And this is also all stuff you can track. So you can track. Um, Whenever links are safe, you can even track how many users are clicking links if you want uh, and, and get a feel for, you know, the types of users that are generally falling for, uh, you know, those types of attacks. And that's actually where the anti-phishing protection is right there, is that, you know, we, uh, we can analyze uh, emails and things like that as they come in and, and the links and the attachments and we can verify that there's not like a phishing attack going on where, you know, a, a hacker has is making it look like, a, you know, an email or something's coming from your bank or whatever it is to try to lure you into clicking it so that they might be able to steal your credentials or trick you into installing something malicious. Ultimately, though, the goal here is to prevent this type of attack and uh, allow us to put policies in place that can uh, not only try to stop it, but also detect it, alert us, and um, try to educate us on what we can do to prevent more of this in the future. And I now want to talk about some of the really great policies and rules that we have in regards to uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365. So here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click the show all lip symbol and go to this security blade here. When we click that, that is going to bring us into the Microsoft 365 Defender Security Center. And when we get into here, we're going to scroll down a little bit here until we see where it says policies and rules, which will show up under email and collaboration. So we'll click that. And here we are under policies and rules. We're going to click on threat policies. Now, let me go ahead and forewarn you. This is yet another one of these warnings. Uh, this is a area that seems to change every week. I know you've heard me probably say that before, but I always like to warn everybody. Uh, it is impossible to, to keep up with the amount of changes that this interface goes through. It's just about every week it feels like. So be advised that I do work hard to update my videos, but it is a, a losing battle, I'm afraid, to try to keep some of this updated constantly. Um, but the main thing is that you get these concepts down. So um, here we are in threat policies, all right? And you'll see it's broken up into, into three sections, technically four sections, because there's an other section, but template uh, templated policies and then just policies and then rules, those are your main areas there. Uh, looking at templated policies, so we'll start there, but let me say something first. Um, my, um, with Microsoft Exchange, we have something called EOP, Exchange Online Protection. And that's just included with most any version of Microsoft Exchange you, you online you have. Pretty much any of the subscriptions and all that that are available to you, um, you're going to have uh, Exchange Online Protection. That's going to include anti-phishing and anti-spam, anti-malware, but... Defender for Office 365 is going to bring to the table some incredibly powerful capabilities, namely safe attachments, safe links, and all that. Uh, and so it's, it really, really complements what Exchange Online Protection brings to the table when you add all this stuff in here. Okay. Now, the first thing we've got here is this preset security policies. This is, as you can see here, it tells you this easily configurable protection for applying all policies at once. So, in other words, I'm somebody, maybe I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm kind of new to all this, and I just want to blanket everything with these policies. Uh, and this is a sort of a default, you know, these are like the defaults Microsoft recommends. So I can very easily go into that, and I can go right here to where it says Manage Protections, and then I can apply this, create this policy. I'll just say, okay, I want to do it for all my recipients. I want to protect all my recipients. And do I want to apply the Defender uh, 365? That's the safe link, safe attachments. Yeah, all my recipients. Next, do I want to support you know, impersonation protection? It tells you here it's going to 
throw that in there, but you got to specify some domain names. It says add email addresses to, to flag with impersonation, impersonated by uh, attackers. It tells you add internal or external addresses of people who might be impersonated by the attacker. So you could add specific users. Okay, so anyway, we could go through this wizard and we could just blanket it all with these policies, right? What I want to do is I want to I want to drill into this a little bit more. So let's go back over here to threat policies. Um, we're going to dig into these a little bit more on these uh, policies and rules. But before we do, there's also a configuration analyzer. I'm not going to dig into that one a whole lot right now because it is really what I'm looking at. But I will show it to you just briefly. This is a place I can go in and it's going to um, provide me with some policy information and uh, capabilities and features that can help identify issues in the uh, current environment of my configuration. So um, I can look at these uh, policies here. You can see we have anti-spam, anti-phishing, anti-malware, safe links. These are recommendations that they give us. And of course, if we go and we throw out the um, threat policies over here, preset, it's going to configure a lot of that. But I'm not going to, I don't want to dig into that one right now. Let's, let's get into these. So we'll start with anti-phishing. We'll go ahead and click on that. All right, you'll notice that there's already a default policy there, and there's one that I had created a while back, but you have this Office 365 anti-phishing default that Microsoft gives you, makes available to you right out of the gates here, and you can see some of the uh, capabilities in it. You've got an impersonation protection. This is all about trying to prevent somebody from being able to impersonate your uh, users via email. Mostly this is like focused on a lot of spear phishing attacks where you might have a scenario where um, somebody emails somebody at a company from like an accounts payable scenario and says, oh, this invoice needs to be paid. And, you know, they, they email as the manager saying, hey, pay this invoice and then tricks an individual into sending money to somebody that shouldn't get it right. This is the idea there. So you'll see a lot of this is turned off by default. So it's, it's up to us if we want to turn this on. This uh, impersonation, domain impersonation, trust and impersonation of senders and domains. So these are things we could turn on. All we got to do is edit that. All right. And then you'll notice, too, there's even a little slider bar here. You can go most aggressive. So they tell you the default value, the severity of the action is taken on the message. Depends on the degree of confidence the message is. Is uh, phishing, low, medium, high, or very high confidence. And this is based on uh, a machine learning and different uh, AI that it uses for determining that. And of course, the further up you go, the more aggressive it gets. So, of course, the downside of that is you could have some false positives. So this is something you kind of have to play around with a little bit. Um, but I could enable this, enable it for domains. I could include domains that I own. I could include custom domains. So this will include all the, the domains that I've already got in my environment and then I can include custom domains if I wanted, right? Um, enable mailbox intelligence. So this uses the AI that's going to determine user uh, email patterns with frequent contacts to uh, identify potential impersonation attempts. You've got enable spoof intelligence. So this is all stuff that, you know, just comes right out of the gates here. Now, if I wanted to, I could create one of these policies, right? Name it whatever I want to name it. Um, if it was maybe for the sales group, right specify you know the group i want to throw in there if i've got a group called sales um and domains any domains i want to put in there uh, and then of course i could i could change these settings to to what i want all right and it would just be for that one group right that's the idea all right so i can also have little tips that pop up and that's what they're talking about here it says if the message is detected as a spoofed by um, a spoof intelligence, what do you want it to do? Move to the junk email or quarantine the message. That way an admin could look at it, right? So at that point I could submit it if I wanted to. So that is the anti-phishing. Let's go now and take a look at anti-spam. And you'll notice there are three little default policies here. We have one that's monitoring uh, spam for inbound. Uh, so it's a policy for that. Then you've got a spam for outbound. And then you've got a connection filter. So it's actually looking at the connection that is being established between servers. So if we click on each one of these, we can we can see some of the different uh, uh, features and rules or policy rules that they've applied. We've got 
a bulk email, so it monitors for bulk email, the threshold being set to seven. It looks to see if there's uh, what types of URLs are being used, like .biz or info, image links to remote sites, if any of that's on there, numeric IP addresses, redirect to other ports maybe, empty messages. So these are some uh, things that I can have it look at for deciding whether or not something is spam. Embedded tags, form tags, so you have lots and lots of these little features here. I could edit these if I wanted to. I could also create a new policy if I want, inbound or outbound. Now connection filter, if we click on that, that's just a, um, as you can see here, it's a, a safe list or a block list. So I can go here and say, always allow messages from the following IP addresses. Uh, always block messages from the following IP addresses. So I could turn on safe list if I wanted to. Now we can also create one of these, just like before I could say, okay, well, sales um, anti-spam, give it a name, specify maybe the sales group, click next. All right, we got this little threshold we can move up or down on bulk emails, what's considered a uh, bulk, right? So they tell you that right there says it can be between one to nine. A lower value indicates benign bulk email. Um, you know, it tells you here that if it's newsletter ads you signed up for, mail for known good bulk senders. A high value indicates bulk messages is bad, likely unwanted. So we can kind of play around with that. Again, you run into the same issue here. You can definitely get some false positives, you know, if you if you go too high on that. So then you have a spam score. Specify whether to increase the spam score for messages that include these types of URLs. So, you know, if it's links to remote sites, so what's a spam score? It gives it a higher number, and the higher the number, um, at that point, it decides to that it's spam based on a ranking system here. So that's the idea. Empty messages, you know, HTML. So you have all those that we just saw. Sensitive words, all right, contains specific language. You know, you could specify that and then configure the test mode. You can also do a test mode options for when a match is uh, made uh, test enabled advance. You can also add what are called X headers. I'm not going to get into a lot of depth on that, but if you look those up, there are certain commands that you can instruct the email server to do with these things called X headers. Okay, but um, that is the idea of the connection filter policy. All right, so let's go back now. And let's talk about anti-malware. Okay, you'll notice that there is a default policy here I can click on and you can see the protection settings. You have enable common attachments filter. So this, this does monitor attachments. Let me tell you though, if you've you know if you got the Defender for Office 365, the safe attachments feature is way better than what you're getting there. Uh, you've also got zero hour auto purge. Now this is a great feature, and what this does is Let's say that some malware maybe slips in uh, to your environment, and um, this can actually work with spam also, but let's say it gets into your environment and um, the, the different rules and policies didn't catch it. Uh, well, a policy being, you know, policies being a group of rules in most cases, but um, let's say it doesn't catch it, okay? But then all of a sudden, somebody in your environment does notice it and reports it. So they have an option to report it, flag it as junk, uh, as malware. Um, at that point, it can, the uh, exchange services can go in and it can pull that email out of everybody's inbox and throw it in junk mail. Um, and so it can also, you know, mark this email as infected and all of that. So that is called zero hour auto purge. That's a great feature. So then you have notify for email for undelivered messages, notify admin notify an admin, sorry, for undelivered messages, notify admin for undelivered messages, for external and internal. You've also got custom notifications. So you can edit these uh, features if you want, turn some of these features on or off. You, you've got this quarantine policy that can be uh, configured. Not gonna jump into that just right now, but that's kind of nice. So permissions to release quarantine messages will be ignored for messages with malware detected and we will fall back to release request instead. So default, uh, you have admin only access policy or default uh, full access. So that's a quarantine policy for quarantining so that an admin can make a decision on whether or not something should be passed through. 
that's what it is, kind of in a nutshell there for you. And then you have notifications. Do you want to notify admins? And also there's your customization if you want. So that is the idea there. And again, you could create one of these policies if you want to. Okay. So let's jump over now to, um, sorry, that, that's how your anti-malware policies work. Let's take a look at safe attachments now. Okay, so again, this is a great feature. This is one of the neatest features, I think, of this whole thing. And what this allows uh, the system to do is whenever uh, users receive an email with an attachment, it allows for this Defender for Office 365 to open up that attachment in what's called a detonation chamber, which is essentially a virtual machine type of environment that checks to analyze what that uh, attachment is trying to do. That attachment, if that attachment is trying to execute some kind of code or, uh, or modify a system file or something like that, it's gonna analyze what it's gonna do. And then if it's clear, it will allow it to go through, but if it's not, it can, it can block it. So this is a great feature. Let's take a look. So you'll notice I've got the built-in one right here, and then there's one I've created a while back. All right. And sometimes when you, first come in here you can get these little error messages like that so if that happens to you don't be surprised it does uh, it does happen um, and sometimes just refreshing your web browser will uh, will solve that problem so let me try that and see if that makes life a little better for me all right so here we are uh, refreshing back here clicking on built-in so here it is the built-in policy you can see the built-in tells you right here uh, Microsoft Office 365 Security applied to all users in your organization to protect against malicious links and attachments. It's got built-in protection, so these are just kind of your default ground-level uh, policies that they've uh, put in place. Okay. Now let's create one, and I'll just call this Sales uh, Safe Attachment, and then click Next. We'll tie this to the Sales Group. Click Next, and at that point, you have some uh, settings that you can choose from. The first is Off. Off basically means, hey, I'm not going to scan anything for the sales group. Then I've got Monitor. Uh, monitor. monitor is going to uh, just monitor. It's, it'll deliver every email, every attachment, whether it's got, you know, whether it's got something malicious in it or not. It's going to just monitor. Then you got Block. If it detects there's a malicious attachment, so it opens up in the detonation chamber, and notices it's malicious, it's going to block it all together. All right, uh, and then you've got replace. So replace will block the attachment, but it'll deliver a message to the user. Now they do tell you that this uh, this is to be deprecated. The block action will uh, you know will be applied. Um, now let me tell you what's really coming into play that's really really cool, and that is this feature right here, dynamic delivery. This is the one that I think is the neatest feature of all. This, what this will do, one of the problems with this whole detonation chamber thing is it can take a, a, about a minute sometimes for it to properly test every attachment. So you can imagine if, if a salesperson is on the phone with a customer and the customer is emailing the salesperson something, uh, maybe a document that they've signed or something. Um, and so they're on the phone, they're like, okay, well, I emailed it to you. And the, the salesperson says, well, I haven't gotten it yet. Um, after 10 seconds, they have no patience. So they're like, oh, I haven't gotten it yet. Well, they went, you know, five more seconds. I haven't gotten it. So you know what that person does? They end up sending it again. And then the person's like, I still haven't gotten it. So after 30 seconds, the person sends it again. Well, so it's kind of frustrating, right, that that happens. And the reason it's so slow is because it's testing the, the attachment. With this method, what will happen is the person emails, and it'll automatically, it'll, it'll be sent to the user, to the salesperson, but they will go ahead and receive the email, and it'll get a, they'll get a message that lets them know that there's an attachment, but the attachment is being scanned, and it will show up momentarily. So it lets that person know that the attachment is going to be uh, showing up. So that's a great little feature that we, uh, we could utilize if we want to. All right. Um, so then if we want, we've, we've got the quarantine policy. It's kind of the same thing we saw earlier. We have redirect messages with detected attachments. We could have a redirect that maybe maybe I want to redirect that to me, like as the admin, okay? And then I can say apply safe attachment detection response if scanning can't complete. So in other words, you know, hey, if uh, if it tries to scan and it doesn't, it's not able to scan, then um, go ahead and perform this action here and also send an email to the admin. So that's the idea there. So at that point, I can click to submit that if I want. 
Let me warn you that it can take a while for these to fully take effect. Sometimes it could take a maximum of 24 hours, which it usually doesn't take that long, but it can take that long. So just kind of a, uh, a forewarning on that. All right. All right. So this is a great feature, definitely worth checking out and utilizing in your environment. Let's take a look now at safe links. So this is a similar concept as uh, safe attachments, but the only difference is it's analyzing links and opening up the links in a detonation chamber virtual machine. So when somebody receives an email with a link associated in that email, uh, it can actually open that up. It has a, a web browser in this detonation chamber. It's going to open it up and see where it goes uh, and look to see what it's trying to do, see if it's trying to execute anything, and then it can decide what to do from there. All right. So you have a built-in protection policy right here, okay, with just some of the preset uh, features and capabilities in it, but we can create our own, okay? Sales safe link, click next, set it for the sales group, click next. So then here's what we've got. It says if you turn, this is obviously turned on, right? So that means turn the feature on. Safe links checks a list of known malicious links when users click links and email URLs are rewritten by default. Okay, so um, it's also gonna it's gonna it's not gonna show them the actual link that they're clicking, just because they don't want a user typing in that link by seeing what it is. So if it ever prevents a user from going somewhere, they don't it doesn't want to show them what that real link is. Uh, apply safe links to email messages sent within your organization. So you can apply this to emails even within your organization or not. I could turn that off. I don't want to do it within the organization. Apply real-time URL scanning for suspicious links. That means it is doing this in real time. Um, everything is being scanned. This also can support uh, Microsoft Teams and all that. So if somebody's typing a link into Teams, it can, it can test that. Um, you've got wait for URL scanning to complete before delivering the message. Do not write URLs do do check via safe links API only all right so that's another little thing you can you can turn on don't have it rewrite if you want uh, do not rewrite the following URLs and that so you'll base it on here so I could say well you don't have to you know you don't have to rewrite URLs that have exam lab practice.com on the end of them right so if I wanted to do that I could those are all safe so then, am I using this with Teams? Yes. Am I using this with all other Microsoft apps that can support it? Yes. Do I want to track user clicks? Yes. Let users click through to the original? No, I'm turning that off. Display the organization branding on notification warning messages. So if we have branding, uh, if you go back to the uh, portal at Azure.com, there's a branding uh, blade you can go to where you can brand with your company logo and text and all that. So we'll click Next. How would you like to notify users? You can use a default notification or you can set a custom message you'd like them to see. So next and then submit and we've now officially created our uh, new policy. All right. So very cool, neat feature. By the way, all these policies, you may notice there is a priority over here um, and you may wonder what happens if there's ever a conflict. Well, the lower the number, the higher the, the priority. So basically, if, if I, let's say I was a user and I was in, uh, the HR group as well as the sales group, for some weird reason, um, the HR group links would override the sales group links. So that is how priorities work with all this. Okay, so you can you can increase decrease by moving up or down the priority there. Okay, last little bit here. These are just some additional rules we can apply. We can say a tenant uh, allow and block rules if we want. So block external email addresses for or domains to prevent communications with users in your organization from sending or receiving. So we could add that. We can also have spoof centers. We have a list of, uh, so you can specify a list of spoof domain pairs that are all, always allowed or always blocked. You can specify some URLs. So block a URL to stop users from accessing the web page and prevent the delivery of emails containing the URL. And then finally, files. Block a file to stop users from accessing it and preventing the delivery of emails containing the file. So that's what these little features can do for you. Okay, you got email authentication settings. 
So they trusted arc sealers, as they call it. That's an authentication received chain. Not going to get into a lot of depth on this right now, but this is an additional authentication system. It tells you that it, uh, it preserves uh, authentication across intervening devices. So it's an additional check that happens between like email servers for verifying somebody's email account. And so is this DKIM, Domain Keys Identified Mail. This is a way of uh, using digital signatures and all that for verifying DNS names. So that when email is being delivered, when it checks DNS names, you're making sure you're getting the uh, IP address and everything from a legitimate email server from legitimate DNS uh, resolution. So that's what this is. All right. And we'll come back over here to threat policies. We have advanced delivery. So there's a few features here, SecOps, so security operations. I'm not getting a lot of depth on that. It's more of a, you know, getting into deep into the email stuff. There's also a phishing simulation feature that you can support and there's some third-party stuff on that and then we've got an enhanced filtering so some additional things here this gets into supporting some third-party so essentially some of this is just third-party related and this is where we can configure the quarantine policies that you might remember seeing a little earlier okay so if i want to set a custom quarantine uh policy here i can specify um you know what I want to call that and this it says specify what access you want you would like recipients to have when the quarantine policy is applied limited access recipients can view quarantine messages but they cannot release messages from the quarantine state or you can set specific access so specify exactly what recipients can do with quarantine message so set release action allow recipients to request a message to be released from quarantine or allow recipients to release a message from quarantine so that is the uh, the idea there. You notice you've got some default ones already that you can look at. All right, lastly, we have evaluation mode. This is the configurative uh, Microsoft Defender without impacting your production. So this is allowing you to evaluate some stuff here without actually messing anything up. Definitely something you can check out, but I'm not gonna jump into that right now, okay? All right, I know that was a lot to take in. There's a, obviously a lot of policies there, definitely some fun stuff to dig into and play around with. So I highly recommend, you know, jump in there and explore on your own if you can. Play around a little bit with it and get familiarize yourself with some of the settings. I'd now like to show you how we can identify threats that have happened involving our Microsoft Defender for Office 365. So here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click on the show all lip symbol here. We're going to click to go uh, the security blade here. And that's going to take us into the Microsoft 365 Defender. So once we are in Defender, if we scroll down a little bit, we will see email and collaboration. And then further down, there is a blade called Explore. And that will take us into this Explore area here, which... Uh, Microsoft is uh, called in the past, I've called it Thread Explorer. Um, so right out of the gates here, you can see various tabs. We've got a tab involving just show me all email, malware related, phishing campaigns, and then content malware. So if you look down right here, you can see I have uh, four delivered, or four emails t uh, blocked and one email delivered, it says, right there, right? Um, and if we click on malware, we can scroll down and look to see if there's any malware that is detected. So no malware that is detected. What about phishing? So phishing email, no phishing. What about campaigns? All right, so no campaigns have been ran, um, you know, against trying to, um, you know, test and, and probe at security. And then we got content malware just in general, any documents or any of that. So none of that, but we do have some email um, data here to look at. All right. And if we scroll down, it took it a second to show up. But if we scroll down, you can see the date this occurred. And also we can look at URL clicks. So if a user has been clicking URLs, We've got the top URLs that have shown up, top clicks, targeted users. So this would be uh, any you know specific users that have been targeted by some kind of an attack, right? Um, you can see the email origin here as well. 
um, we can scroll over. You can see that the email origin looks like it uh, it's appearing in Seattle. That's because the emails themselves uh, have been essentially test emails from Microsoft. All right. But let's go back over to campaigns. There's not been any campaigns. Let's go back over to email. All right, and you can see the, the email information that we're getting here. So one says threat analytics report from Microsoft 365. We click on that. Um, we can see there was no threat there. It was delivered. It was a delivered email. And then below that, we've even got sender's IP address, the recipient. Uh, it was inbound. Everything passed as far as the DNS checks go. And you can see URLs that were linked inside. Um, so there's no threats found in any of that, right? So we click on this next one. It says we detect the synchronization errors. This involves my uh, Azure AD because I had shut my domain controller down. Um, and so it's letting me know that there is, um, you know, it's basically just an email letting me know, hey, you're, you're um, it's not synchronizing. Okay, all these URLs are good. All right, there's a weekly PIM digest and we got an undeliverable here. All right, so then it's saying that um, origin location was dropped, latest delivery location. The sender was postmaster at examlabpractice.com. Um, and so essentially what's going on there is it's trying to send email as a, a email address called postmaster at examlabpractice.com, uh, but I haven't set up uh, an email account for that. So it's blocking that because it's not able to verify from the email servers that that is a legitimate uh, email server. So this is the reason why it blocked that. So it wasn't there wasn't any malware involved there, but that's it's basically letting you know that you know there is a an issue there with the email itself. All right, and essentially it's the email servers itself. Okay, um, then down here. There's a it attached an attachment on delivery. It's trying to attach the report. It's trying to send on behalf of this postmaster. Again, that does not exist. Uh, we've got another thing here. It says resolve, resolve synchronization problem. That's that's you getting into again um, the domain controller being down. Okay, so anyway, when you click on these, when you find things, you've also got take action. So I can say take action move to another mailbox, junk, inbox, deleted, just delete the email, soft delete, which means you can undelete it if you want, hard delete, permanent delete, deletes it. You can uh, report as clean, report as phishing, report as junk, report as malware. Uh, you can also do tenant level. So I just want to block the sender in general or block the entire domain or initiate an automated investigation. Investigate email, investigate recipient, investigate sender, contact, or I could say, hey, let's propose a new remediation. So I could click that, and we're proposing a new remediation. Specify a remediation name if I want. All right, let's say remediate demo here. Give it a description, set a severity level if we want, and then click submit. All right. So at that point, we, um, we are creating this remediation request. Now, something else that we can do that's really neat is uh, we can click on this open email entity. We can open this up and it's going to provide us some more details. We look right here, we have a timeline. All right, and if, if we wanted, we can look through here, we can see if it says it's threat, no threat detected, uh, latest delivery dropped, or, you know, origin delivery dropped. So we know it was dropped, delivery action was blocked. We know it was blocked because of the bad um, email uh, account, not actually being legit. Uh, we can see the um, time it received. We can also click on analysis and it provides this copy of the, copy the message header below and paste it into the message header analyzer. So you can actually open up the message header analyzer they're telling you about and uh, they're telling you that you can, you know, copy the uh, the text of an email and paste it in there. So if you have the um, message header of the email, that information can be copied into this 
uh, message he uh, header analyzer. Okay, so it says message details couldn't be found. So there's not really a lot of, of data there. Let's actually go back and see if um, let's go back to Thread Explorer here. And let's take a look at one of these other ones. See if we can get anything out of that open open email entity. All right, so this had some uh, some data associated with it. So we'll copy that and let's try pasting it in here. That's the raw data and we can analyze headers and it will provide you with some additional information. It kind of organizes everything in a somewhat of a readable format to provide some information to you. So authentication header information, DKIM, means it's just checking DNS to make sure it's all legitimate. Okay. Anti-spam code information. Sometimes you'll glean some uh, helpful information from that. Like you can, if this came from like a, it's it's mostly that that trick right there is mostly geared towards phishing. If if it's fake email headers and things like that to try to trick people, that's where that's going to usually come in handy. Okay. All right. Now, if the one last thing I'll show you, if there is some kind of a campaign going on where you're being attacked or users are being attacked, multiple users, you got phishing attacks and content malware. Another thing we can do is we can come over here and look at Threat Tracker, and that will show us these uh, various threats as they've come in. So this is only going to show you threat information, whereas uh, that in there we were able to see kind of a look at, at everything. Um, so tracked queries, trending campaigns, that's going to provide us some uh, some information on that. Okay, Anything that uh, has come in. Now... I'm not really diving into this right now, but that's where you kind of get into in, to be able to do uh, investigations and then what's called, um, if you go into um, hunting, you can use what's known as advanced hunting. It's a little bit out, scope of, out of the scope of what I'm getting into right now. This is where you can run all these queries if you learn the query language. So you can, you can definitely get into this a lot deeper, but it's kind of outside the scope of what we're looking at here. But hopefully that now helps you understand the concepts of utilizing this Explorer Blade to help track down what types of, of threats might have um, been involved in regarding your users. Now as I move into the concepts of, of data loss prevention, uh, I think it's very important that you have a little bit of a foundation of what it is and why do we use it. So I want to spend some time on that looking at uh, what data loss prevention is, DLP, and why is it so important to an organization? Okay, so what is DLP? Data loss prevention. One of the biggest things about this concept is it's, it's all about trying to comply with um, business and industry standards that are important in our workplaces today. So when you think about working for an organization, working for a business with high security needs and all that, you have to consider the types of information that are flowing through your business. So think about your your users and the documents and emails and uh, team messages and all that stuff that they're working with and consider if there is any um, information that could potentially be passed outside the organization. Now there is a term that involves any time information is being passed to a place that's not supposed to be like the outside world, they use a term called data exfiltration. Uh, there's another term called um, data leakage as well. And so one of the things we want to think about with DLP is that this is all about trying to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Prevent information that's supposed to be kept on the inside from making itself to the outside. So. Uh, in order to do that, we have to first be able to identify what information is sensitive, and then we have to have controls in place that can prevent that sensitive information from making its way out, right? So data loss prevention, that, that is one of the, the number one goals, is to prevent this uh, type of scenario from happening. Uh, data exfiltration, data leakage, all of that good stuff. Now, here's some examples when you, when you want to think in terms of 
you know, sensitive information. So this is this works hand in hands with uh, hand in hand with sensitivity labels, uh, the information protection side of what we get with uh, Azure and Microsoft 365. So we're looking at things like financial uh, information. We've got PII, personal identifiable information. We've got PHI, protected health information, tax information. You know, you have to think about people's um, social security numbers, tax ID numbers, company tax ID numbers. All of that stuff is going to fall into this category of sensitive information. And for compliance purposes, our company needs to keep a close eye on it and make sure that information doesn't flow from one place to the other that it's not supposed to. So there's all sorts of, of different um, sensitive pieces of information uh, that we can, we can draw upon and look at and scan utilizing uh, information protection and data loss prevention. Now again, this does work hand in hand with the information protection side of, of Azure and Microsoft 365. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look at sensitivity labels and uh, allow us to identify, with the help of sensitivity labels, we can identify which pieces of information is considered sensitive. And then from there, we can create our data loss prevention policies to analyze those things, whether a person is trying to share, let's say, a document. Let's say a document has a social security number in it or a credit card number or something like that, and maybe they're trying to share that information via email. Um, DLP, with the help of Exchange Online da Data Loss Prevention, it's going to prevent that. Or how about SharePoint or Teams? Um, with data loss prevention policies put in place, it is going to be monitoring those sorts of things and, and looking for those. And the thing you want to re uh, remember here is that it's not always a malicious insider that's doing this. It's not always like somebody who's evil that's inside your company or that's hacked into your company and they're sharing information out. If you think about it, a lot of it's accidental, right? Um, I'm sure some of you can relate and say, well, I've, you know, I've accidentally emailed the wrong person before. Uh, have you ever done that? Or, or maybe you almost did that. You know, what if you had a sensitive piece of information attached to an email and you emailed the wrong person? Or what if you were communicating on Teams and you posted a, uh, a document in a Teams channel that was accessible by people that um, should not have access to certain information? Perhaps you're a, a, you, you, know, you have somebody that's in a finance environment they're a finance person and they have a document that has payroll information in it and they accidentally post this document instead of posting it in the Teams channel for the finance, they post it in a, a public channel that uh, other employees that are not part of finance have access to. So it's important for us to have policies and other controls in place that can analyze this sort of thing and monitor this sort of thing and prevent that from happening whether it's uh, something that's happening maliciously or whether it's something that's accidental, right? Another thing that data loss prevention policies are helpful about is that they can provide tips to users as they, if they do accidentally make a mistake, it can pop a message up and say, hey, you're not supposed to do that, here's why. Um, and then also another thing about policies is that we can allow a user to justify why they're doing something. Perhaps um, there's a scenario where uh, a data loss prevention policy sees that there is a social security number that's being shared, but what if it's not actually a social security number? What if it, it thinks it's a social security number because it matches a pattern of a social security number, but it's actually not a number that, um, that, that's a sensitive number? A user could be given the option to justify it. So this is another thing that data loss prevention policies is going to let you do. Um, and so finally, uh, with data loss prevention, not only can we put these policies in place, but we also have nice little reports and monitoring capabilities that's going to tell us any time a data loss prevention policy has prevented something or if it allowed a user to justify it and flow through uh, successfully. Ultimately, though, as, uh, as administrators, we have the ability to utilize these reports to monitor what's going on. All right. So data loss prevention policies is a very effective system that Microsoft has supplied us with for keeping a close eye on the things that are being shared in our environment. So one of the number one concerns that we have in a lot of sensitive environments where security is a big deal is the concept of leakage of data, right? There's been lots of companies and organizations over the years in the world that has had sensitive information leaked out and Microsoft is going to try to help us combat that. Now, one thing I always like to tell people is that if you've got a disgruntled employee or somebody that works for your company, somebody who's very unhappy, 
chances are they'll probably figure out a way to leak information, but maybe we can at least catch them. The thing to understand about leakage in Microsoft 365, though, is that we can prevent a lot of accidental leakage from happening by uh, implementing all of this. So yes, it's potentially you can stop somebody from doing it on purpose or catch them, at least audit that they're doing it, but also a lot of the accidents that can happen can be uh, prevented with the help of data loss prevention policies. So let's take a look at all that right now. Here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click the show all ellipse symbol and we're going to go down to compliance. That's going to bring us into Microsoft Purview. And uh, once we get into Microsoft Purview, we'll look over here to the left and look under solutions. We'll see data loss prevention. Okay, so we can drop that down, that data loss prevention drop down blade. And from there, we can click on where it says policies. So this is where you can create data loss prevention policies. And as they, as they tell you here, you can use DLP to, to help identify and protect your organization's sensitive in, uh, information. For example, you can set up a policy to help make sure information in the email and docs isn't shared with the wrong people. So let's go ahead and click to create a policy. All right. And so first off, we could, if we wanted to, we could, um, we can create a custom one. We can base this on privacy. This all ties back to sensitive info types. So if we go here to data classification, classifiers, and we look at uh, sensitive info types, that's what this is all going to basically link back to. They've grouped some of these together so uh, into certain sensitive info groups. So. But anyway, let's go back over here to uh, Data Loss Prevention Policy. We'll click Create. And then I have these groups or categories of sensitive info types I can choose from. I'll just go with, um, how about privacy? And we will do the, let's go with the Patriot Act. All right. So that'll contain, you know, private information, P, uh, you know, credit card information, all that. So we'll click Next. And you can give it a name. I'm just going to leave it as a default. We'll click Next. Do we want to use administrative units? We can. If we've got administrative units, I'm going to click Next. And then what uh, areas do we want this to apply to Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, Devices? We can do on-premise repositories. I'm not going to do that in this video. But um, from there, we'll just select those. And we'll click Next. All right. And you can go with the uh, default settings keep in mind it will let you change some of the defaults or you can do customize advanced we're gonna we're gonna do default uh, first here so we'll go with the review and customize so these are gonna take some default settings but we can customize it and really all advanced is gonna do is just let you choose you know what you want and there's a couple other little settings that you have in advance but there isn't too many settings in customize advanced that you'll you won't see here so anyway we'll click next all right, so information to protect. Uh, this is the information I can protect. If I want to add some additional things I want to look at, uh, add additional uh, sensitive info types, I can, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click Next. Okay, so then it says, we'll automatically create detailed activity reports so you can review the content that matches this policy. What else do you want to do? When the content matches the policy condition, show policy tips to users and send them a email message. So that's kind of neat. What happens is if they, let's say you have a user who tried to share a credit card number with somebody. Like here's an example. Maybe uh, you have a user named John Smith at examlabpractice.com who is trying to share a uh, credit card with Jane Doe at examlabpractice.com and Jane Doe is part of the finance department and so is John Smith. However, when John Smith goes to send an email, John Smith actually uh, chooses a email address for a different Jane Doe that's not part of our company. He selects Jane Doe at abccorporation.com, who ABC Corporation is not part of our, our organization, obviously. So at that point, what would happen if he tried to send that email is he would get a pop-up message in Outlook that lets him know, hey, this is a, a tip. You, you're trying to share data with somebody that's outside your organization and all that. So this is helpful. You can also customize that tip if you want. Uh, then next thing you have is detect when a specific amount of sensitive info is being shared, at least 10. So uh, from anywhere from 1 to 10, 
or more instances if you want. Now, you may say, well, is it only going to pop do this if it's got 10? Well, bear with me on that. You'll see in a second how that's going to work. Uh, send incident reports, so an email. So it's going to send at your admin's uh, incident report. You can choose which admins you want. Send alerts if any of the DLP rules match. You can have a, uh, alerts that get generated. You can even customize you know, how many instances this would have to have before it would generate an alert. Restrict access or encrypt contents in the Microsoft 365 locations. When somebody tries to do it, it, it forces encryption on it. So if it was to get copied outside the organization, it would all be encrypted. That's what that's going to do. So we'll click Next. Customize access and override settings. So by default, users are blocked from sending email in Teams chats and channel messages that contain the type of content you're protecting. But you can choose who has access to shared SharePoint and OneDrive files. You can also decide if you want to let people override the policy. So I can restrict access or encrypt contents in all the locations. I could say just block the users from receiving email or accessing uh, secured SharePoint OneDrive Teams. By default, users are blocked from sending Teams, chats, channels. So you're basically saying block it, right? Um, then you've got audit. I'm going to say just audit and restrict the activity on the device. So they won't be able to, it's going to document that they try to do it and then it's going to prevent them from doing it. Service domain and browser activity detects when protected files are blocked or allowed to be uploaded to the cloud service domains based on an allow or block. So you have a allow or blocked domain list here. Okay. Um, then you've got file activities. You can apply restrictions to whatever activities. If they're trying to copy data outside the clipboard, it's going to audit only, copy removal to a USB, audit only. I'm going to say, you know, we'll say block. Copy clipboard block. So if that person tried to copy a credit card out of the spreadsheet or whatever, if it was a spreadsheet or email or whatever, it would block it. So copy to a network share. You know, anyway, you can select which of these you'd want. Now, your company can also... Uh, combine that with Defender for Cloud Apps if you have that, which can link to other third-party products that can prevent uh, these activities work in conjunction to try to prevent these activities if uh, a person was using a product that wasn't, you know, directly Microsoft 365. There are other devices and all that can be they can be monitored, uh, such as what's called a cloud access security broker type device. That's what they're talking about with Defender for Cloud Apps, but I'm not going to get into details on that right now. So then in um, file activities for apps and restricted apps groups, so restrictions enforced for apps and restricted app group will override any restrictions you configured in the file activity. So you can have what's called a restricted app group, which we don't create here. Uh, and that can override what you did up here. So for certain apps, you could have an exception if you wanted. All right. Uh, then it says restricted app activities detects when apps that are on the restricted apps list attempt to access protected files on a device. What do you want to do? Access restricted apps or, you know, allow uh, with but audit it, block with override or block. I'm going to say audit. So at that point, we're going to click next. Do I want to test this out first, turn it on right away or keep it off? I'm going to turn this on right away click next and we'll click to submit now as with a lot of other things in purview sometimes when you implement it you do have to wait up to 24 hours before it will fully take effect so just a heads up on that and also if you have a new Microsoft 365 tenant sometimes you will get an error when you first try to do this so you do have to close out of that give it a few minutes and try again if you do get an error all right at that point we're gonna hit done and we've now created our policy. All right. Now, one thing I can do is I can go back and click this policy. All right. And I can um, read the description of what it is, see the status, see basically what it applies to. And interestingly enough, I can see here it says low volume and high volume. Okay. So that's interesting. I didn't get an option for low volume and high volume. That's one of the advanced settings that you get. So um, you know, if I actually click this and then edit the policy, let's click edit. Uh, you can go in once, once the uh, edit box comes in here, you can m edit that stuff. So we'll click next. You can't change the name of it, you'll notice. Change the locations, 
Okay, here's where you can change some of these conditions. So you have a low volume versus a high volume. So if it finds a lower volume of uh, this instance of any of these items, then it applies the, the actions here. Notify users when uh, with email and policy tips, audit. And if it's high volume, notify users, audit, and then send incident reports to an admin. Now you can edit these and you can scroll down and you can see what's considered low volume. Anything from one to nine is considered low volume. By the way, if you went to the advanced settings, this is the screen you would have saw. All right, you can, you can modify this in, uh, in this method here. You can set a volume count and all of that. Um, and if you go to the high volume one and edit that, you'll notice that is basically 10 and up or 10 and any as they call it. All right, so what are some of the other stuff we've got? A lot of this is the same stuff we've seen, but we can also customize the email text, email subject, customize policy tips, show policy tips and dialogue for end user before send, provide a compliance URL if we want, um, some more information on user override, specify um, send email to certain people. So if I want to have an email sent to, we'll say, um, where's my IT users here? We'll do help desk. Help desk group. If you don't have a help desk group, you can always create one. Uh, anyway, you can change this to whatever you want to change it to. Modify these settings. This is all part of the incident report. The name of a person who last modified content, the types of sensitive content, the rule severity, content that matched, and the item containing uh, that content. So we could save all of that. So that is how you can modify that uh, those settings as well as what the advanced settings are. Now I want to show you something else. If I go back up here to data class uh, classification and click on classifiers and go to system, uh, sensitive info type, I have created a sensitive info type called employee ID. All right which uses keywords if anybody puts in the words employee ID or something along those lines then that would be that would flag it as a sensitive info um, but I want to create a DLP rule a policy which is really just a group of rules uh, that's going to utilize this so that's going to be I'm going to do that through custom I'm going to go down to data loss prevention we'll go to policies here we're going to click to create a policy click next and custom and then click next okay I'm gonna call it employee ID policy so we'll click next and not gonna add administrative unit you know we'll we'll do this on let's do this for um, all of these right here we'll click next Okay, it's going to make me create an advanced one because you can't do custom one with the with the, the first option. So we'll click next. We're going to click create a rule. Okay, I'm going to call it a monitor for employee ID keyword. All right. And we're going to click to add a condition and we'll say contains and we'll add a sensitive info type. And the sensitive info type will be search for employee. There it is, employee ID keywords. All right, now we can decide what to do. So use uh, actions to protect content, restrict access or encrypt the contents, locations, audit or restrict activities when user uh, um, accesses sites in Microsoft Edge browser, audit restrict activities on devices. So we'll say that and then um, it says detects when uh, protected files are blocked or allowed to be uploaded to the cloud service domains based on the allow block. So we could say, um, you know, upload a restricted cloud service domain or access from an unallowed browser. We can, we're currently auditing that, or we can say choose different restrictions for sensitive domains. Okay, all these items here we've seen, you know, block, allow, audit whatever it's going to be 
Um, and so I'll say block with override block block. All right. So from there, file activities, I could restrict based on that. Um, use notification to inform users and educate them. So that would be, you know, policy tips and all that, letting them know, hey, show users a policy notification when activity is restricted, customize a notification, uh, notify users uh, in Office 365 service plans with policy. So yeah, we'll notify users who sent, shared, or last modified the content. It's going to email the user. You can customize any of that. Allow overrides. Specify the severity level. We'll say that this is of high security. Send an alert to an admin if we want. So we'd specify that. Okay. Um, send alert every time activity matches the rule or if you want to set a certain amount. At that point, we'll click. Uh, we've got to assign a priority, top priority, very bottom. And then if you want to, you can say test out or turn on right away. We'll click next and we're going to click submit. All right, so we've now created a couple of policies, made those policies available for us. Of course, this one's taken a moment to create. Um, again, let me remind you, it takes, can take 24 hours to take effect, and sometimes you can get an error. You have to give it a few minutes and try again. Okay. Uh, all right. The, uh, the last thing I want to talk about right here is order. When you have multiple data loss prevention policies, the lower the number, the higher priority. So if there is any kind of a conflict there, um, you're going to notice that basically the lower the number, the higher the priority. Okay, And you can move up or down using these uh, little arrows that you see right here. Okay, All right, well, hopefully that helps you now understand the concepts of the data loss prevention policies we have in Microsoft Purview. I now want to take a look at where we can see uh, if you had a scenario in which a data loss prevention policy was triggered due to somebody maybe sharing some sensitive piece of information with somebody they shouldn't or maybe outside of the organization or something along those lines. I want to show you where we would be alerted. Now, the first thing to be aware of is inside the data loss prevention policy, you could, you could have set it so that it emails a admin. So an admin will get an incident report uh, via email. That was a checkbox you could have selected when you were setting up the policy. But what I want to show you is the alert side of all of this. Now I'll also kind of warn you that Microsoft does not allow us to trigger a full-blown data loss prevention policy in a little trial tenant. They don't let you uh, get the full full effects of, of everything in here. There's not really a lot you'll be able to see or trigger here, but we can definitely I can definitely show you what you need to know, and I'll show you a little bit of uh, some other little facts and um, visuals that Microsoft provides. So here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click the show all lip symbol, and from there, we have security and compliance. We're going to start by going to compliance, which will bring us into Microsoft Purview, and this is where we set up our data loss prevention policies, right? So once we get into purview, if we scroll down, we can see the data loss prevention drop down blade and then there's where our policies are. But right below that is alerts. So this is how we can see any alerts that have been triggered. But you're going to notice that uh, Microsoft gives you a, a basic listing of what the alert would say. It would tell you the alert name, the severity, whether it's a low, medium or high, the status. OK, uh, and then time detected. So from there, and as far as status goes, you'll see right here, active, investigated, resolved, or dismissed. Those are your different statuses. But uh, Microsoft has now integrated this into Defender. So just remember, Purview and Defender are very, very linked together. You can't really learn one without the other. Um, and they've even provided a button. They tell you, did you know uh, you can now manage your data loss prevention alerts through the Defender portal? It's automatically combined into incidents. Incidents actually provide you a lot more information than just a standard alert does. So how would we see that? Well, we can click this button, but I want to show you how we would get there without the help of this button because Microsoft might eventually remove it. If we go right here to portal.microsoft.com again, this time we're going to click on security. That'll bring us into Microsoft 365 Defender. And then right there, we'll see incidents and alerts. From there, we can click on incidents and this is where that would show up. So any data loss prevention policy 
uh, that's been triggered will show up as an incident. All right, and you'll get the incident, incident ID, tag, severity, investigation, state, all of that. In fact, Microsoft has a, a, an example of what that sort of looks like here, as you can see the various things that you can do here. This is on their incident and alerts um, in the Defender Portal article, which you can just do a quick Google search if you want to pull this up to search incident and alerts in Microsoft 365 Defender. You'll find this article, but that's where, where this is at, okay? And so from there, you can, you've can you got an incident name, you've got the incident ID number, there's a tag that you can associate it with, whether it can specify based on severity level, you can have different investigative states, the categories that it's linked to, the assets that were involved, all of that good stuff. Now, you can see a lot of the same information here, even though we can't see it on ours because of our, our little uh, trial subscription and all that. If I jump into threat intelligence back on Microsoft 365 Defender, you can see threat analytics here and you'll see a lot of the different threats that could potentially show up. You can see information about those, the vulnerabilities and all of that that, can, that are involved. If you click that, you can get more information. I'm not going to dig into that in this video, um, but stay tuned, all right? Um, ultimately though, those are going to be the places where you can investigate incidents, alerts, uh, any type of reporting that was generated from a data loss uh, prevention policy. Now, don't worry, there's more to come on this. Um, the ultimate thing you got to understand is, as you get deeper into this, we can trigger a few things and we can get more reporting um, details, but um, that'll come as we get deeper in. I now like to get into planning and understanding the concepts of insider risk management. So what is insider risk management? All right, so insider risk management is the of course the concepts of being concerned about users within your organization that are doing things that maybe we wouldn't want them to do. This could be accidental, this could be malicious, but insider risk management is actually a um, set of tools that are available in Microsoft Purview. So this is more than just a general concept of, hey, I wanna protect myself from insider risk, but it's actually a set of tools that's gonna to assist me with uh, with doing that, all right? And again, this is found inside Microsoft uh, Purview. It is a compliance-based solution that's gonna help us with detecting and investigating any type of malicious uh, activity from, in, from inside our company or even accidental, all right? We're gonna be able to set policies that are gonna help us to find what types of risk that we want to look for, and then we can even, um, if uh, we do find say some malicious activities or something like that that we want to escalate, we can escalate those into a case within Microsoft eDiscovery Premium. Uh, we also have the ability to uh, just look at analysis information. So we can have a risk analysis done and uh, help us determine uh, if our company is the, at the proper compliance standards that we want them to be at. All right, so what are some of the modern risk pain points. In other words, some of the, the issue, you know, the areas that, that a lot of organizations have to be concerned about. Um, so this is definitely going to follow things like leaks uh, of sensitive data or what they call data spillage. That's, you know, where information gets leaked out um, uh, due to maybe uh, information being associated with something that's shared around. You could have sensitive information in a file that it really serves uh, a specific job and the information is just extra information that's found in that file and then the in the information that you're actually needing to share maybe you share a document that has this extra information in it that you didn't even really mean to share but it's in that document so that gets into things like data spillage we have confidentiality violations um, people are communicating and saying things that they really shouldn't say uh, intellectual property theft, so IP theft, where people are just uh, using someone else's intellectual property uh, for, the, for their own gain. You have fraud, obviously, in, insider trading, and then, of course, we have to be concerned about regulatory compliance violations. So that gets into, you know, some of the different regulatory compliance like HIPAA and PCI DSS and GDPR and some of the various... Uh, considerations for regulations that we might be under based on the country we are from. 
Uh, also, in some cases, uh, in, in like the United States, there's actually some regulations that are specific to what state you're in. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, to consider here that in your modern workspace for uh, your users, your users could be anywhere. They, they could have a, a workspace at home, in the office, their, their workspace could be in a building, which is their workplace that they actually work, or it could be at home, right? Could be anywhere. Uh, users are able to basically create, manage, and share data uh, off various platforms, various pieces of software, and um, it's harder nowadays than it was decades back to keep control over things just because everybody's so spread out. Um, it also enables people to say things uh, a lot, you know, have a lot more privacy than they once did when they were all together inside of a building where people could, could hear what people are saying. Uh, nowadays, with all these messaging uh, programs and the ability to send emails and all that, we need other tools to assist us with this, and this is what we're, uh, we're trying to do with this. Here's some of the principles of insider risk management. First would be transparency. There's a balance between trying to provide privacy for our users versus also trying to keep uh, our organization's sensitive information safe. So transparency with risk management is to try to provide privacy by design. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, you can allow certain key personnel to have access to some of this insider risk management but we can also have uh, usernames and things like that hidden in certain circumstances so that these certain people don't know who these people are. Now, of course, certain admins can also determine uh, uh, the users in question and have access to the data and everything else that um, is being potentially misused. Okay, uh, We've got configurable or configurable policies. So there's policies that are going to uh, help us with uh, dealing with all of this. We have integrations, so it's all integrated with Microsoft Purview and all the uh, Microsoft 365 apps and all that that use that are utilized with Purview. And then finally, uh, actionable, meaning that we have some inside information and alerts and notifications that lets us know, hey, um, there have been some issues that have arisen and we need to investigate those and take action. Here is the workflow that Microsoft kind of lays out for this. Um, so you'll notice that, you know, first you might define a policy or set of policies that are going to help us in triggering alerts and knowing that um, something has occurred. Then when alerts do occur, we would triage, and pre triage means prioritize, right? We would put priority over, um, you know, the more severe cases that may be, uh, you know, may, may have issues that have arisen. And then we would investigate the triaged um, priority-based um, alerts, the things that we feel like we need to investigate first. And we would then take action. Um, now, part of this might involve collaboration with uh, not only compliance, but human resources, the legal department, the security team. So there might be various people or departments that need to be involved in this workflow process. So as far as policies go, and again, this is kind of the starting point, um, Microsoft provides us with a, quite a few uh, template, policy templates that we can draw from for uh, setting all of this up. You'll see that listed here, data theft by departing users, data leaks, or uh, it, not just general data leaks, but you can have priority users you want to focus on, um, risky users you want to focus on. We can do general security policy violations or we can be more specific and base it on departing users, risky users, priority users, um, patient data misuse. Again, that gets into, into HIPAA compliance, the medical world, and then also things like risky browser usage. And then, of course, you know you can customize and mix and match and filter and all of that with these policies. Then you've got alerts. So one of the things a policy is going to do is trigger alerts. We'll have an alerts dashboard that we can go to take a look at uh, what's going on and review those alerts and um, can be based on the user's ID, the user's name, uh, alert, the, the, the alert type it was, the status, the severity of the alert, the time it was detected. Um, 
it'll assign what's called a case to that and then you can look at the case status that gets into sort of um, if we are uh, actively taking action on this alert or if we haven't taken any action yet that's the idea of a case status and then we can look at things like risk factors um, and so Microsoft will in some not all cases but in some cases provide a type of risk factor that could be involved in the type of alert that was discovered so then we triage so we prioritize right and um, we would look at the activities that have occurred and uh, prioritize that uh, so for example if you got a new user and a new user is triggering uh, alerts right out of the gates then maybe we triage that because this is a new person for the company and we would want to you know try to review and evaluate that um, but ultimately it's up to us on how we triage or how we prioritize we do have the ability to filter through the alerts and uh, based on severity we could prioritize simply based on that if we want okay then we've got investigate so again um, once we've kind of decided which alerts we need to focus on we can investigate and you'll go to the what's called the case dashboard so uh, everything's these will be broken up into cases and uh, we can investigate based on that case and it'll pull everything into this this case dashboard and we can look at the specific information we want based on things like user activity so what activities were performed um, you know we could filter through the activities or the history of the activities the risk history of that user or users that were involved we've got content explorer which lets us see the data files any kind of email messages that were involved um, we can view all of that and then also as we are reviewing data we have what are called case notes where we can type information related to what we've discovered it may be that uh, this goes on for multiple days we have multiple people that are doing the investigation and so we want to make sure that we uh, jot down anything that might help uh, investigation continue and the very last thing here is taking action um, so one of the things we can do if we have eDiscovery premium not just standard but premium we can uh, escalate the cases that we're investigating into eDiscovery premium that means we can basically pull all that over and it can be put in a format that can be used by a legal team or a court of law and with with uh, eDiscovery premium we can involve legal teams very easily uh, and give them access to um, the cases for taking legal action so if, for example if a user is discovered doing something malicious that's illegal like maybe insider trading or something like that um, you know we could get the legal team involved and they can assist with the e utilizing eDiscovery premium uh, finally the last thing there at the very bottom last bullet you'll notice it talks about Office 365 management APIs um, one of the things that we can do with all of this data is it can be exported to a SIEM product or SIM however you like to say it which is security information and event management um, and this data could be pulled into to that type of product as well and uh, this can also help us with organizing and dealing with reporting and some people aren't you you know some people have their have a third party SIEM product so Microsoft wants to be um, wants to play well with others and allow for the ability to export okay but ultimately of course taking action is our last step that's where we're actually you know gonna um, in you know not just investigate but we're gonna you know this could be getting involved getting legal involved or it could involve uh, having a meeting with the people involved you could be firing the person that's involved there could be some kind of disciplinary action involved or it might just involve training the employees if they make mistakes and accidents they need to be trained so that might simply be the action that's taken but um, ultimately insider risk management uh, in the Microsoft purview is all about giving us the the right tools to be able to detect different things that are happening investigate these things and then take action now the first thing to know if you are going to implement insider risk policies is you are going to need the proper licensing for it uh, the licensing for this can be a little bit odd a little bit confusing and so we need to take a look at that first so if we go to Google or Bing and do a search for Microsoft insider risk uh, management licensing you can find this little 
uh, link right here, get started with Insider Risk Management. If we go there, it tells us what we need in order to support this. Um, so you have to have, for subscription licensing, Microsoft 365, E5, A5, F5, G5 subscription, paid or trial. Uh, or the E3, if you got E3, you will need uh, the compliance add-on. If you got Microsoft 365, E3, A3, F3, G3, you will need um, one of these or the in, with the in, Insider Risk Management add-on. Or if you got Office 365, E3, um, you will need um, EMS E3 or, and the Microsoft 365 E5. For some reason, they don't even mention Office 365 E5. But pretty much, uh, it's it's going to go hand in hand with this right here. Now, um, in my case, you know, right out of the gates here, I have the Office 365 E5 and I have EMS E5, but I don't have this one right here, so I've had to add that one. So what we want to do is we want to go and we would want to find this, and we would need to activate the free trial of the Microsoft 365 E5 compliance add-on. If you want to do hands-on with this, this is going to be the way to go. Okay. So if we come back over here to portal.microsoft.com, we go to the uh, mic uh, marketplace. All right, if we go to all products, okay, and then we'll do a search for, let's do add-ons and we'll just search for compliance. The keywords compliance. Um, and then you'll see the Microsoft 365 E5 compliance. So Microsoft 365 E5 compliance, that's what we need. So what we would do is we would go to details on that and then you can do the free trial. I've actually already enabled the free trial on my side. Um, and so, but what you would need to do is turn that on. And then the other thing that I've done with that is if I go over here to licenses, and keep in mind you may not see the exact same licenses as me if you're doing this. The only one we really care about here is this one. I've already assigned that license. Once it loads up, you'll see it to myself, John Christopher. You can see it gives you a total of 25 to kind of play around with. Uh, I've also, the others that matters, I have Office 365 E5, and then I've also got Enterprise Mobility plus Security E5. So those are the licenses that I've, or subscriptions I've already got. Those are really the only ones that matter here. Now, once we've activated that, you might need to wait about 15 minutes. But you click Show All, go to Compliance. That'll bring you into Microsoft Purview. And once we get into Microsoft Purview, we can scroll down and we'll see. You, you'll have Insider Risk Management anyway, but what you won't see when you click on it is you won't see the ability to really do anything. It's just going to have a bunch of information about it. Um, but if you have proper, if you have the proper subscriptions, you will see uh, this stuff here. So that's how we know that uh, everything is there, and that I can now go over to policies, and I have the ability to create a policy if I want to. Okay, so I'm also going to notice here it says scan for potential risk in your organization. Turn on analytics to scan user activity daily. You'll get real time. Uh, anonymized insights to help you set up and refine policies so you're detecting the most recent acti relevant activity. So I can go ahead and say turn that on. Okay, now they do kind of warn you that this is going to take some time before this will be officially uh, available to really gather analytics. As with many things in Microsoft 365 and Azure, you have to be patient. We're going to go right here now. We're going to create a policy. All right, and then you're going to notice that it breaks into these categories, data theft, data leaks, security policy violation, health record misuse, risky browser usage, and I can select various things here. Now, one thing you'll also notice is that um, it says data theft by departing users, in this case, uh, detects data theft by departing users near the resignation or termination date. Um, so there's some prerequisites here. It tells you that you can utilize... Um, an HR connector, uh, and they tell you details about setting up an HR. If you have some kind of HR software or something like that, um, you can add connectivity with that for uh, dealing with HR. You've got physical badge connector as well, so if your company is using a, fit, a badging software, 
for like their ID and stuff, their badges that they carry around with them. You can link to that. All right. Tells you you got triggering events that'll do this HR data imports termination resi resignation date. So if you're using HR software, this can be imported in. It also can um, be imported in and linked with CSV format as well. If you look at the article on that, you can do that. We don't really have to dive that deep into it here for what we're doing, but um, you can look at data leaks for priority users. So you could choose specific users that you want um, maybe to, to analyze with this. So I could choose and set up like a, a, a link to a specific group. You'll see how I can do that here in a moment. Uh, security policy dot violation. So you can configure stuff here. Now, now you will notice that a lot of this will require Microsoft Defender for endpoint. If you want to utilize uh, security policy violations involving um, the policies like down on a machine. Okay. Right here, you've got health record misuse. You can link a healthcare connector if your, your organization is using an uh, uh, EMR electronic me uh, medical record system. You can link to that. They talk, they show you how you could do that here. And then down here at the bottom, we've got risky uh, browser usage. Um, so from there, I could link to any machine that's uh, uh, linked into my Azure AD environment or intra-ID environment, as it's now called. Um, I can I can utilize that. Okay, so we'll click next on that one. I'll just call this Demo Insider Risk Policy. We'll click next. Do I want to include all users? Do I want to include a specific user? So I could do all users, or this is where I was telling you you could do specific users or a group of users. So I'll say include all, next. And then uh, uh, from there, it's asking me decide whether to prioritize content. It says you can prioritize content based on factors like where it's stored and how it's classified. Risk scores are increased for any activity that contains priority content, which is turned on which in turn increases the chance of generating a high severity rate. Specify what, uh, specifying what content to prioritize isn't relevant for templates you selected. So it's telling you I don't really, for what I'm doing here, isn't really a priority-based um, solution. That's why this is grayed out. So I don't want to prioritize content right now. Click Next. Some of them you will, because you'll have to select a series of things you want to look for. Like, for example, um, if I would have gone and done some of these other ones, I'll have options for like prioritizing SharePoint over other items, for example. So then it says uh, user browse to a potential risky website, select which activities will trigger this event. Unable to select some indicators, this is because they're currently turned off in your organization. So we can turn that on. Okay, it says turn on indicators within your organization. All right, so I could say, um, I could choose specific ones, or I could say turn on all indicators. So this is stuff that's obviously not turned on by default, but I can now turn it on. So now I can I can you know go through here and say you know child abuse websites, criminal activity, cult websites, any of these that I want to look at. I'll just turn them all on. Next, then it says each trigger you selected user uh, uses default thresholds to bring users into the scope of a policy. Threshold is based on the number of events recorded for an activity per day per triggering dimension. However, you can bypass these defaults, specify your own. So if I wanted to do custom, I can set a number of times this can happen a day to trigger the uh, alert information and all that. I'm just going to um, stick with the defaults, which is pretty much just 10. But we'll... Um, you know, as you can see, those are the defaults, but we'll stick with that. So we'll click next. It says, okay, you've selected your indicators. Indicators generate alerts. Basically 13 indicators that I've selected. We're going to click next now. Now it says, decide whether to use default or custom indicator thresholds. Each indicator you selected uses default thresholds that influence activities risky uh, risk score, which in turn determines whether an alert severity is low, medium, or high. Okay, the threshold is based on the number of events recorded for an activity per day, and it does tell you, however, you can bypass these defaults and specify your own. It also tells me that, do I want to turn on analytics to get recommended thresholds based on a daily scans and all that, so I could turn on analytics. I can go with the defaults on that, or I could select my own. So if I'm getting, you know, up to 10, it's considered low, 20, 
medium, 30 is high, so on and so forth on each of those. I'm just going to leave it set to the defaults and we'll click next. And at that point we can review everything we've done and we'll click to submit. It does tell you this can take up to 24 hours for any of this to take effect. So you do need to understand that you're not really going to see a whole lot um, going on until all that happens. I've also got this down here. It says send me the following emails when a new policy generates its first alert, when new high severity alerts are generated, and weekly summarization. Okay, save my preferences. Let me also kind of warn you that this is all changing constantly. This is another one of those features that Microsoft it feels like they change it week after week after week. So, you know, don't be surprised if your screen looks a little different than mine. It's just part of having to get used to the way the cloud world works. Um, you got to get used to things not always looking the same. Even when you read Microsoft's own articles, the screens don't look the same. Um, so you do have to understand things are constantly changing here. But that's it. I'm going to click done and my policy has now been created. And uh, as you can see, this is that's going to be the process for setting up an insider risk management policy. Now, when it comes to dealing with uh, investigating any type of uh, insider risk management issues, there are some roles that you need to be aware of. So I want to show you that right now. Here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click show all and go to compliance. That'll bring us into purview. And now we're going to go down here to roles and scopes. Click permissions and we are going to look under Microsoft Purview Solutions and Roles. We'll go there and we're going to scroll down and look at our, so here it is right here. So you'll see various ones here. Um, the, the most powerful one really is Insider Risk Management. You would think that Insider Risk Management admins would be the most powerful. This is for somebody to administer uh, Insider Risk Management. You'll see it has case management, data connector admin, insider risk management admin, and view only case. So it's not actually the most powerful. Um, you'll see you have insider risk management analytics. This is for somebody to analyze case management, insider risk management analysis, and view only cases. You have investigators. So technically, if you are wanting somebody just to be able to investigate, this would be the role. Case management, custodian, insider risk management investigation, review, and view only. Now, if you come back up here to the one just called insider risk management, look at all the stuff it has. So basically, case management, custodian, uh, data admin, insider risk management, admin analysis, approval, audit, investigation, session, review only, view only case. You have you know, all of these items here. So we're just going to click edit. And we're going to add ourselves, I'm going to add myself here, JC, to that um, role, give the role privileges to it. We'll click Next, we'll click Save, and then we'll click Done. Now I also do uh, recommend waiting just a few minutes before trying to continue. You do need to give that some time to kind of process through, just a couple of minutes. And then at that point, you should be able to go over uh, into right here where it says Insider Risk Management. Okay, so here I am on Insider Risk Management. This is what it will look like when you first go there. But you, if you wait a few minutes and you refresh your web browser, the rest of these uh, menu items should show up. So let's go ahead and refresh our web browser and see if it all shows up. All right, so slowly but surely loading might take it. There it goes. So you can see that you can see that all these other uh, menu items are here now that I have given myself the proper permissions. Okay, so the first thing to look at here is alerts. And by the way, they do have this little checklist for you here, which is kind of helpful. And so I definitely recommend in the real world for sure, kind of going down this checklist and you can watch their little video about it and all that. Keep in mind that this is another thing that does change all the time. So just be advised on that. But if we go to alerts, you would be able to see any alerts that have been generated based on the policies that we've created. We've created one policy. If you've got a machine that is linked in here, you could uh, try and, uh, go to some websites and things like that and trigger this to go through. But this is where alerts would go through um, right here. High, medium and low would be able to see those alerts, um, review the policies that are associated with them. 
And then if you want to look at reports of, of all this, go back over here to overview and we'll scroll down and you'll see right here um, where we've got manage alerts, manage all cases, view all users, and then down here at the bottom, investigate user activity. We can click on manage reports. So that, that is how you would go about looking at the alerts and then viewing the reports. So right here it says create a user activity report. So if you did have some users here, uh, I could say the start date, set the start date, the users you want to look at, uh, and then you would click to create the report. So for those those dates. So it would actually go through and search through the activity of this user now and uh, eventually you know it would finish creating this report. But haven't really had a whole lot of activity since I've turned this on. And you really do need to wait. That's the downside of that, about all of this. You set this up, uh, and I hate saying this, but you really, when you turn all of this on, before you're really going to start seeing a bunch of information, you really got to wait about 24 hours for it to take effect. But you get the idea here um, of uh, you know this all being generated. You can see the alerts. You can see the reports. You can see all of that here. If you generate the report, if there's any data to show, it's going to show that. Notice it says related case. If there was a case associated with all of this, again, that could be imported into eDiscovery uh, Premium if uh, you've got eDiscovery Premium. All right. But I can go back over here to Insider Risk Management. And again, I can see a, a kind of an overview of, of anything going on. Look at my alerts and uh, go back over here and look at reports. Not getting into these other tabs in this video, just wanted to show you alerts and reports. Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're gonna learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the, this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.